Welcome, my friends, to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm Casey Gomez, and I'm thrilled you're joining me today for a fun conversation with a passionate author. We're kicking off the program like it's our tradition with a short reading from the feature book. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get started. Hello, my name is Russell Zimmerman. Most of the time I go by Rusty, but when I'm writing and publishing and all that, I go by Russell, so I sound a little bit less like someone's dog. I'm here today with an excerpt from one of my first Battletech pieces. This was in Shrapnel issue 11 from a short story called Seal the Deal. It's a story about generational industry and generational trauma and a company that's trying to make giant stompy robots. So without further ado, I will kick it off. We're aboard the Leopard class dropship Caridwin. Brandon sat in what had once been the Caridwin's starboard aerofighter bay. For decades, it had been an office. It had been the office of Mountain Wolf Battle Mix and the quarters of the man who called himself president and CEO. It was his now. His office, his ship, his company, his problems, his name, his time. He stared hard down at the comms gear resting before him, taking in a deep breath, letting it out slowly and composing himself. He only wanted to do this once. He needed to focus. He needed to get it right. He had several crucial messages that needed to be sent today. These recordings would be delivered through slower, cheaper, more conventional means than Comstar and their exorbitant prices. They would travel slowly, but they would need to be perfect. These messages would require finesse, certainty, a smoothness that Brandon didn't know was in him, a confidence that he feared was bordering on being a lie. For them to believe it, I have to believe it. Do I? Do I believe in Scarlet, in Chief Cole, in my own work? Do I trust them when they say that this project is possible? Do I believe in myself enough to tell other people that they should believe in me? There was only one way to find out. He hit the record button and began the first message. Thank you all for your recent kind words. We here at Mountain Wolf Battle Mex and me personally have had an outpouring of support from so many familiar faces that frankly, my head is spinning. From the Lyran Commonwealth to the Draconis Combine, from the Outworld's Alliance to the Magistracy of Canopus. My father spent his life making friends, not just partners, every place he went. And now those friends are reaching out to comfort me after his passing. I've received condolences from every corner of the inner sphere, and I'm grateful for all of them. He took another breath. Focus. Look the situation right in the eye. Say it out loud. But I don't need your condolences. Damn, that felt good. All right, but fix it. Smooth it over. Walk it back. Brandon glanced down at the old wooden pipe that rested on his desk. His desk. His father's and his father's before him and his father's before him. All of it now his. I don't need your condolences because my father isn't dead. Not truly. So long as a single Mountain Wolf battle mech is standing at the ready and helping you defend your worlds, Mountain Wolf battle mechs is alive. And so long as Mountain Wolf Battle Mechs is alive, every O'Leary is still with us in spirit. I'm not only sorry that I lost my father, though. Mountain Wolf Battle Mechs lost its CEO. I'm crushed that my father passed before he could show you a presentation that I've taken the liberty of attaching to this message. I hope it isn't crass to combine business with a personal communication like this. But you all knew Michael. Business waits for no one, he would say. Living or dead, Brandon thought. So please look over the attached documents and consider Mountain Wolf, especially for your militia clientele. We've partnered with all of you over the years to maintain an exclusive limited production and distribution of Nighthawks and Slings. And I know my father appreciated every one of those partnerships and was proud to work with all of you. Exclusive limited production sure was a nice way of saying an anemic trickle of failing life support. No one had produced or distributed a sling in centuries, but now was the time to be polite, not honest. If you read those documents, you'll see the specs for something new. 
And by new, I don't mean new only to Mountain Wolf Battle Mix, but all new, entirely new. For centuries, Mountain Wolf has been synonymous with specialized machines. Some might say over-specialized. And while nothing fills the niche of a Nighthawk quite like a Nighthawk, and nothing does what a sling does, just like a sling, there's one thing I've learned in all my own travels. It's that over-specialization isn't always needed or wanted, especially by rural militia units. Over-specialization is for bugs, Brandon had wanted to say. But talking down your theoretically current designs wasn't the best way to talk up your new one. We were too hungry to over-specialize. We need a generalist. Sometimes you need a mech that can do it all. And, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we've designed one. A brand new battle mech. Every one of you will recognize components as you look over Mountain Wolf's new design proposal. There, you'll see that I'd like to keep sourcing these parts from all of you. Hesperus, Dunyanshire, Canopus, Twycross, Tharquad. I grew up on your homeworlds as much as I grew up on this ship. Mountain Wolf Battle Mix wouldn't be what it is without each and every one of you and the parts that you supply. And I want each and every one of you to continue this partnership and make this new mech, a brand new mech, a reality. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the Merlin. If you want the energy-based long-range punch and the endurance of a Nighthawk, he can do that, and then some. If you want to reach out and say hello with reliable long-range missile volleys like a sling, he can do that too. But if you want reliable laser fire in medium ranges, he has that covered. And he also carries as much armor as those two mechs combined. And he also brings along a Zippo and a Sperry Browning to dissuade infantry. Brandon allowed himself a smile as he looked down at the many scribbled notes and sketches that he, Call, and Scarlet had drawn up. The Merlin was an ugly, effective beast. The Merlin's beautiful, he lied. The Merlin runs at the standard expected strategic speed for its weight class. It jumps when so many of its fellow heavy mechs don't. He shoots like nobody's business, and he can shoot at any range at any target. He's been designed from the ground up for compatibility of parts, ruggedness, and simplicity. He's a dream to work on with generous specs and with input from our mech techs every step of the way to make him easy to retrofit, maintain, and repair. He can do it all. And as I'm sure you've noticed, he does it all for about 5 million sea bills. He let that figure hang in the air just long enough that they'd all double check it. They'd all do the calculations. They'd all marvel. What Brandon O'Leary was proposing wasn't just bold or even breathtaking. It was considered impossible. So sell the impossibility, Bran. The Merlin does everything you want a mech to do, like magic. Hi everyone and welcome back to Inside the Minds of Authors. I am so excited you guys are joining us on this fabulous Monday. If you're new to the podcast, make sure to subscribe. You don't want to miss a single episode. We have new authors and incredible books every Monday night. So hopefully you guys are joining us. And I'm sure you guys are enjoying that reading as much as I did because, oh my God, yes, Mr. Russell Zimmerman is here on the show and we're going to talk Battletech. So hello, dear. Welcome. How are you? Hello, I am doing good. Thank you. It's nice to see you again just a few weeks after the convention where we met. It is such a pleasure to talk to you. It is so exciting just to kind of talk shop with you because you have such an unconventional way of getting into the publishing business. So we need to dive in. And for all the people listening, they're going, is it really him? Yes, it is. Tell us about it. How did you get into this business of writing Battletech? Because I need to know. Well, I got started on the Battletech front mostly by being a prolific Shadowrun novelist for a long time. They're owned by the same company, and I had been writing a lot of Shadowrun for about a dozen years before I decided to take the plunge and jump over to Battletech, which was my first war game as a kid growing up. So I'd always loved the property, but I just never kind of taken the plunge and wanted to work on it professionally. And eventually my editor asked enough times that I bit the bullet and went for it. My way in the door for Battletech 
was to kick in the door for Shadowrun about a decade earlier. It's been really cool to jump in and work on properties like these. Shadowrun is the role-playing game I was playing. It's how I met my wife. So we've been playing it for literally decades. I started playing Shadowrun and bought those books and stuff like literally a few months after they first came out. It was early 1990, you know, and I've been a fan ever since. And then with Battletech, I've been a fan for ages. Still got my like old school original box set from when I was like a freshman in high school. So 30 some odd years ago. And it's just really cool to get to add to those, to get to contribute to these properties and to get to tell stories in those same universes that I grew up. So yeah, it's really cool. I've always said when you don't geek out about this job, it's time to do something else. And I'm very glad to say I'm absolutely still geeking out about this job. So that is such a great way of looking at it because I'm going, (laughs) oh, my God, you are living your dream in so many different ways. The question comes back. You didn't set out to do this. This is not what Russell decided he was going to go to college and do for his life. So how did that happen? Let's back into that because you just kind of hinted and didn't actually tell us how did you get into this? Yeah, I actually went to school to be a historian, and I am technically one. I got my master's in history, taught as a professor for several years. I've been published in historical journals and textbooks and stuff. And while I was doing that, I was also kind of writing part-time as a geek. I initially got my first ever geeky work by just writing fan fiction on forums for another war game called War Machine by Privateer Press. And I was just writing stuff for fun. I was struck by real life letters that like Civil War soldiers were sending home where they used all this very flowery prose. And it'd be like, oh, my dearest Cynthiana, my heart breaks without you. But I know every day as the sun rises on our glorious cause, I am another day closer to being home with you. And like this dude sitting in the bottom of a trench, like with his foot rotting off from trench foot and it's crappy weather and they're eating moldy bread and killing their horses so that they don't starve. And like they're doing all this terrible stuff of what was in some ways our first ever industrialized war right, with this sort of mass-produced awfulness of moving into, like, an era of trench warfare and Gatling guns and stuff. And, like, we know that this stuff was terrible and that they're writing these letters home that are all like, oh, I miss my younger sister, and I hope that she grows up to be half as beautiful as you, and I pray that, you know what I mean? Like, so there was this, like, this really amazing contrast when you're reading these primary historical sources of the types of letters these guys are sending home to their families versus like what you know they were going through, right? So I wrote some fan fiction on the War Machine forums that was basically that. And it was this guy writing letters back home to his family And he's talking about how, like, oh, we're fighting so hard for the glorious cause, and it does my heart good to know that we're keeping you proud. And then I would, like, cut from him writing to, like, some guy next to him in the trench, like, taking a crap. He's like, I'm not lending him more paper. When he asked me to lend it to him, I didn't know that's what he was using it for. No, I'm using this to write my letter, you know. So I just did this, like, jump from, like, this, like, flowery prose to, like, how awful this shit is, right? And I just wrote those for fun, just something to do. And then at Gen Con one year, I ran into the lead editor of No Quarter Magazine, which was a a magazine for War Machine and their sister product, Hordes, as well as the lead fiction writer for that. They were running some games at Gen Con, and I had some absurd dice rolls go my way on a D20 game. And by the end of the session, everybody had come over from other games and was watching my character desperately try to stay alive and save the team. And it was just like super exciting. And it happened to pull those two over and they watched all this happen. And we were BSing after the session and they saw my name on my badge and they went, oh, hey, we read your stuff. And I looked down and I saw their name on their badge. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, like, that's nuts. What do you mean? You guys read my stuff. And uh, yeah, one thing led to another. 
and they offered me a couple of magazine articles in No Quarter, which felt almost like doing history work because it has a very kind of military history vibe in that setting. It's a steampunk type of setting, and a lot of that has a similar vibe to like the Civil War, which is the stuff I was working on at the time for school. And I did a couple articles for them, and then I was kind of feeling like a big shot, and I messaged the line developer of Shadowrun over on the Dump Shock forums, which tells you how long ago this was. I don't even know if there's still a thing, but I just messaged him. I went, hey, I've been published a few times in No Quarter. Do you guys want some fiction? And I got the gig there because I'd written in some fanfic contests on those forums. And he just went like, you're the guy from these contests, right? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, yeah, okay, like we can publish something. We'll find something we need you for. And that was like late 2010. And I wrote my first stuff for a Shatterin book called Attitude. And then since then, I've written about a bajillion words of, of Shadowrun between source books and rule books and new edition books and novellas and novels and more novellas and more novels. Yeah. And it all just started because I had like a magazine article under my belt and I thought I would just message this guy and ask for work and it worked. Right. So that's why I try to tell people there's no like wrong way to start doing this. If it gets you to start doing it, you did it right. You know? I love the fact that it was, was absolute like fearlessness. Like I did this. I have an article. Why not? What was the worst it going to say? Like, I'm just going to send yeah, this message. You just did it. Yeah. And it's, it's like at the time I was wrapping up my undergrad and getting ready for grad school. And I'm just like, I'm not working on a degree in like creative writing where yeah. I might misstep and ruin my career. You know, like I got this history thing lined up, man. What, what the hell? Let's just shoot him a note. You know, I wrote a whole video game that same way, a PC game called Satellite Rain, which we actually won some awards and stuff. Super cool. It was a very cyberpunky game. I was at work around the same time period. I was working third shifts at DHL. Shout out to my hasty overnight international shipping homies. But I was working weird hours there and I saw this Kickstarter launch and I checked it out and it was this cyberpunk video game called Satellite Rain. And I was like, man, this all looks cool, but I'm going to college and it sucks and I'm going to grad school and that's expensive. And I probably shouldn't just like back this. Hey, let's just do this. And I just reached out with the contact us on Kickstarter. And I said, Hey, I've been published in Shatter a few times. Did you guys need some writing done? And like, that was literally, I was just thinking like, maybe they want a little short fiction or something. And it turns out they were like, yeah, like we actually don't have a writer for the game. So yeah, like what's some stuff that you've done? Like they were all like the programmer, coder, graphic designer, project manager type of thing. And they were like, yeah, we were just haven't contracted out the writing. And I ended up getting a job. And like, I wrote every word of an award-winning international video game called Satellite Rain just by literally messaging them on Kickstarter and asking if I could like sing for my supper. And ended up, I got my contracts and stuff. And part of my contract was like dot, dot, dot. And also one of every Kickstarter or backer reward. You, you never know until you try. And it turns out, like, if you do that enough times, it turns into a writing career and, like, it becomes an actual thing. And once you do that a lot and get a reputation in the industry, it gets a lot easier to do that more. So, yeah, it's a really weird sort of unprofessional professionalism thing where it kind of doesn't matter how you get into writing in like the war game and tabletop industry. Nobody cares if you do a good job. If you've got the holy trinity of doing good work, turning it in on time and being pleasant to work with, nobody asks for a CV to go look and see oh, do you have a degree in creative writing? Or, you know, how did you get your first job in the freelancing industry? Like, there's none of that exists. There's no, like, background check beyond maybe messaging other people. I've had a few times where someone will go, hey, you know, this guy reached out and he wants to write some game X. I know he freelances for Shadowrun. You also freelance for Shadowrun. Is he a good dude? 
right? Like you'll get that sort of word of mouth, just kind of spot check reputation vibe thing. And that's it. Like there's no super secret permanent record that anybody is watching. Like no one's keeping an eye on this. Just ask for a job, however you want to ask for it. And it might work, you know? That is absolutely mind blowing and super refreshing all at once because all we hear is like horror stories. There's all these gatekeepers, there's all this stuff in this industry. And basically, it's you're describing a whole different world. There's a whole different community of people that all kind of know each other. I was like, do you yeah, have there's... what it takes to write? That's kind of the catch. Yeah. And th there's a lot of overlap in the industry because, like, so many people that move on to become like the line developer or the lead editor of a game started as just a freelancer for that game right i mean if you look it's this year is 40 years of BattleTech being published it's 35 years of shadow run right like these games have been around for decades none of them still have like the original creators at the helm right everyone in it at this point is kind of an ascended fanboy. Like we all grew up playing this game and loving this game and whatever. So that includes like the line developers and sometimes even the owners of the companies as some of these games have changed hands over the years. But it's like the line developer of game X probably freelanced on game Y with this other line developer they remember each other and they're still friendly and they hang out at Gen Con. And by this point, we're all old enough. We're Facebook friends. I know <laughs> nobody under 30 has Facebook. That's what social media used to be. Like we all know each other and hang out, do podcasts together or play games on like Twitch and stuff together. Once you kind of get your foot in the door with, again, you need that whole holy trinity. You need all three of good work and on time and don't be a dick then you're kind of set for almost as much freelance work as you can take. Like once it starts, it snowballs. I recently reached out to the Black Library, the publishers for Games Workshop. They do all the fiction for Warhammer, Age of Sigmar, the fantasy side of things, and Warhammer 40,000. And I had worked on a 40K RPG several years ago, and I had this email lying around, and I was just like, I'm getting back into 40K. I'm buying some minis. I'm painting some stuff. Man, let's see if I can get somebody to pay me money to think about 40K all this time. And I literally just emailed them and said, hey, I worked on the RPG a little while ago. I'm not sure who's going to answer this email that's just like, it's a generic like editorial assistant. Like if the email is the title, not the person. So I'm like, I don't know if you're going to be this person that I talked to or this person that I talked to or somebody new. But hey, like, do you guys want some short fiction? And like, I've turned in two and I'm contracted for a novel now, right? And that's been in like a month that that's all just happened. So it's like, yeah, the more you do it, the more you can do it. And the answer that you'll get will be something about your backlog of, of work. It's wild. It's almost a fake it till you make it. But that's just the industry norm. Like you literally just do the job and the more you do it, the more people want you to do it and the more opportunities you get. And yeah, like it just kind of absolutely snowballs. You know, I'm loving everything about, about this because it's nothing like the rest of us is trying to write novels and put them out there. <laughs> when you're creating these pieces, let's put the whole logistics of writing into the whole somebody else's IP editor. What are you doing? Like, how do you decide I'm going to write a short story on Battletech? Like, how much of the actual world are you pulling and how much is yours? Like, how does that come to life? Right. A lot of that is going to vary from product to product. You need to talk to the editor first. They almost never just go, write us a short story. See you in a month, right? Especially with like a first work, there'll be a lot more back and forth and they'll want a synopsis with a decent amount of detail and there'll be some back and forth on that. And they might give you a couple of hooks and nudge you in a certain direction. The relationship that you have after working for the same editor for 14 years is wildly different because at this point I've reached a level of trust Shout out to my man, John Helfers, who's the executive fiction editor for all of Catalyst Game Labs. I've literally gotten a novel greenlit with John talking to him for like two minutes face-to-face -face at a convention with like, 
hey, I don't know exactly what characters, I don't know exactly where they're going or why, but it's going to be three or four people driving cross country in Shadowrun. It's going to be called Road Trip. Is that cool? And he's like, love it. Done. Do it. Right? And like, that's it. And Because there's enough there in Shadowrun where in the cyberpunk setting, America's broken into a bunch of different countries and he knows that there's a lot going on there and he knows that I like my secondary characters and he just trusts me to do the work and figure it out. Whereas working more recently with a newer editor, he said, sure, send me a couple of ideas, like three or four ideas. And I said, let me instead ask you a couple of things that you might need. So like, what are some factions that you would be interested in a story about, which for Warhammer 40,000, every faction is a giant army that then people go spend hundreds and or thousands of dollars on their toy soldiers and you invest hours and hours into painting them up. And they try to put out a kind of diverse spread of fiction for each faction to keep everybody hooked and frankly, to make everybody excited about those minis. So I just asked him, I'm like, like, what are you looking for? And then I sent back three kind of paragraph long pitches, two of which were things that he had asked for, a third of which was me just throwing a curveball and saying like, so you kind of reach a middle ground of, hey, what do I want to pitch? What's a story I want to tell versus what can you use? And you pitch a little bit of both and you see what happens? There's just often a lot more back and forth the earlier you are in this sort of thing. As far as actually doing the job, I kind of tipped my hand a little when I said part of what I think our job is, is to just get fans excited about these games, right? It's a lot easier in a, a very kind of tactile way in a war game. If you get somebody psyched to go buy some minis, like they could very easily go buy those minis. So like in Battletech, a lot of what I feel like I'm trying to do is make one specific battle mech feel awesome, right? The pros that I read earlier about the Merlin, that's a mech that was the first ever sample mech created with the mech creation rules 40 something, okay, not quite 40 years ago, but it was never like an actual mech. It was like just a stand-in that they used as a rules example. And then later on, they retconned it into existence. And I've taken that mech company that only makes three mechs, and it mentions all of them in the story. It makes three things. That's it. And in Shrapnel, I've been telling short stories about that company and how they came to produce this mech and that sort of thing. So I just kind of found a little thing that nobody else was telling stories about. And I've kind of peed on it and made it mine. And, and now people are like, hey, if you want to know about Merlins, ask Rusty. So even over on like the subreddit or on Discord, if somebody asks something about like the Merlin, I I'll get tagged and I'll show up and try to sell it to them like in character, like I'm working for Mountain Wolf. I try to find something that nobody else is talking about, basically. And I try to kind of explain it and make it into a story that people want more of and try to humanize the characters. Like in this case, I had a guy named Brandon O'Leary and we knew that he was running the company. And then we knew that he was running the company 50 years later when they opened another factory. And that's like the only history that we really kind of had to work with on this one guy. So I was like, I'm going to tell the story of Brandon O'Leary. Like he's got to be pretty young when he takes over and this happens I've got some more fiction coming that is actually about his granddaughter, the 50 years later part. So then you see him again as this kind of doting, spoiling grandpa. But I just like, I found a thing that wasn't really fleshed out and I fleshed it out and I got more ideas while I was doing that. And my editor liked all of them and went, yes, awesome, good, more. And just let me kind of keep doing it. I think there's two things you want to try to do and that's make the game awesome. In an RPG tie-in fiction, probably the nicest thing anyone can say is like, they'll message me on Facebook or something and go, hey, I'm trying to make a character like X. Like my buddy's starting up a new campaign and I want to play somebody that works like this guy. And like, 
that's awesome, right? Like I made that archetype feel cool. I made that type of character sound neat and fun to play. Like dope. I did it. You just try to hype up the game and the game world. Make sure that you're working in what I call the game engine of that world, which is a little bit more of kind of a computer video gamey vibe, right? But like what you're doing has to make sense in that game. If you are telling a story set in Super Mario Brothers, it makes perfect sense to jump on a turtle and throw a shell at somebody, right? But like not so much in real life, right? So like just your stuff's got to make sense in the game world that you're telling. So try not to be like a slave to the rules, but keep the rules in mind and then just tell good stories there and the rest will take care of itself. So yeah, just kind of find room, find a spot that you can flesh out and then tell the best stories you can in that spot and make it feel real and lived in and have characters people care about and all that good stuff. So yeah, it's a little bit like cooking with someone else's ingredients in, in a way in that you've got these kind of limitations because you're playing in somebody else's sandbox with their toys, right? And the contracts all make that very clear. This stuff is theirs, right? Then you kind of open the chopped basket and you try to do the best you can with whatever ingredients are in there. So that's a lot of the fun of it. Like just now, right before I opened this Zoom call, I got an email. They're working on some miniatures for one of the games I'm talking about. I can't give it away, but they're working on miniatures of one of my characters. And they've asked me for some input there. They don't have to do that. They've got cover art they can work with and whatever. But like, it's cool because it's like this character belongs to them. It's up to them, but they want to talk to me and get it right. And that sort of thing. And that just kind of comes over time. Legally, it's theirs. They don't have to do it. But again, the character has become iconically mine enough that they want to do it justice. And so they reach out. So there's always that balance between the required legalities and the vibe check of the company. So that's always cool too. That is amazing and beautiful. And the fact that they reached out because you have become the voice of this character says a lot. And being yeah. able to say, hey, give me a fact check. Is it true? Am I there or am I totally off kill? I am so excited and absolutely amazed because you have given fan fiction a whole different way of looking at it. Because I'm going, oh my God, you can make a living playing in somebody else's sandbox and do yeah. well. Yeah. Again, it's just stuff that I was doing for fun. Eventually I reached the point in my career uh, in academia where it was like, look, like if I want to keep doing this full time, I got to get the PhD. And that means going back to school. That means moving to where I get accepted in a doctoral program. And then that means moving to where I can find a tenure track position and that stuff's all like super cutthroat and competitive and also expensive. And I'm uprooting my wife and I'm like, or I could just go hard on this freelancing thing and I can start to write for every property I can write for and I can juggle as many things as I can juggle at a time and I can try to just keep churning it out. And I went that way. And since then, I've written for Shadowrun, for Battletech, for Vampire the Masquerade, Vampire the Dark Ages, Mutants and Masterminds, Gangs of the Undercity, Subversion, game after game after game after game, and now Warhammer 40k. You take all the work you can get and you keep doing it. Yeah, it's pretty neat. I also always want to tell people that like there is no meaningful barrier between fan fiction and publication. Am I a better writer than when I started writing fan fiction 15 years ago? Yes. But that's not because that was fan fiction and this is real fiction. It's because I've been writing a fuck ton of fiction for 15 years nonstop, right? You get better at something the more you do it, but there's no magical plus one to the skill check when you get your first contract. I did not magically get better as a writer now than I was then there is a sense of kind of illegitimacy to fan fiction that I think is remarkably unfortunate. And it's easy to fall into, like we all do it. It's easy to kind of casually dismiss something as amateur. And like, literally that's what fan fiction is. You know, it's an amateur project if you're not getting paid for it. But like, 
it's important to not dismiss the talent and the skill, which are two different things that goes into it. And like, we just yesterday released a Battletech uh, Pride anthology for the second year. A whole bunch of us homos get together and we write short fiction that may or may not have queer themes, but it's written by queer Battletech fans. And we've released the second anthology and it's all, I want to say it was 270 pages. It's, this thing's functionally a novel. There's interior artwork, there's full color cover art, and like nothing magically makes my story better than the story of anyone else that's in there just because I've been published in Battletech before. It's all just loving Battletech fiction written by people that like the setting and wanted to tell a cool story. So go make your own fan anthology. Do it for Pride Month. Do it for whatever. Like anybody that wants to, you can just like write stuff and put it on the internet. As long as you're not getting paid for it, nobody's out to stop you. Make it clear that it's fan work. Don't step on any trademark lines and just write what you want to write and tell that story. And if you do that a couple of times, maybe you'll then get to do it officially and stuff. There's no wrong way to get into the industry. And there's also nothing wrong with not getting into the industry. You're still absolutely valid as a writer. If you just write stuff and put it up for pay what you want or put it up for free or, or whatever, if you are writing, you are a writer done. Like that's what the word means. Thank you. I think so often so many authors just get so caught up in the fact, well, I'm not an author because I've been published. You're still writing. You're still doing the work. Enjoy the process. I love it. All right, Russell. I know I said we're going to keep it short because you have a lot of things going on. So, and we can talk forever. Tell me, where can listeners find you? Where they can get more about you? Do you have a website? How do we find you? Tell us. I try to be pretty accessible as a, a writer to geeks and fans. So you can find me on Facebook, just look for Rusty Zimmerman and then look for the guy with all the gaming stuff in his profile, right? But I'm on there, I'm on Reddit. I'm actually a, a moderator of the Battletech subreddit. So come say hi there, I'm Russell Z. I'm active on a couple of the official Catalyst forums like for Battletech, I'm Critius on that forum. I'm on the Battletech or the Catalyst Game Labs discord my real name is right there so you can find me there just yeah uh, i try to be pretty accessible i have dropped twitter i got kind of report brigaded by some trolls a while ago and realized my life was better without twitter in it since then so i never like contested it and went back so that was kind of unfortunate i had a decent number of followers on there it was going downhill and i was tired of it so facebook reddit discord yeah i'm around if you look for me, you can find me. For everybody looking for Mr. Russell, go ahead and check him out. And if you are a fan of any of this IPs, you need to go check him out because he's doing an amazing job bringing them to life and bringing the stories to it. Okay, dear, before you leave us, are you ready for the lightning round? Lay it on me. Let's find okay. out. Okay. Super easy. Don't think too much. Let's go. Home cooked meals or restaurants? Home cooked. Hands down. Mm, nice. Caffeine or decaf? Caffeine. Indoors or outdoors? Indoors. Okay. Maybe just because I live in Texas. I don't blame you. Right? Outdoors is trying to kill us all the time. It's too hot. Thank so... you. I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> right? right? Yeah. yeah. So, mm-hmm. sorry. Indoors, indoors. All right. Sorry. Next question. Go ahead. Driving or flying? Driving. Really? Okay. And so that you... in- includes like cross-country trips to conventions. We've just started to take a little bit longer vacation and, you know, drive two or three days to get from like Austin to Chicago or whatever and make the road trip part of the fun. Yeah, it's a good time. Nice. Okay, here's your last one a little different. Right. If your life had a theme song, what would it be? Oh, Lord. Um, nonstop from Hamilton. Nice. That's a good one. We'll go with that one. Just keeping busy, writing all the time, thinking about writing when you're not actively writing. But yeah, just that that whole process of being busy, you know, just staying busy, keeping your output up and and all that stuff. But yeah, we'll go with that. Nonstop from Hamilton. Love it. Well, dear, it has been a pleasure and honor. Do you have any closing remarks for us? 
I uh, just thank you for having me on the show. You were an absolute delight to meet at Chupacabra Con. Everybody in or around San Marcos, which is kind of South Austin, come check us out next year. We are the, the area's premier gaming convention, and we're moving into tabletop war games and stuff like that as well after this year. So it's long been a tabletop RPG one. But like this year, for instance, we had about 500 guests and we had over 25 industry guests. So it's a really cool chance to get to meet people and do these panels with us and hang out and ask us questions. And if you sit down to play a game, there's like a 10% chance you're going to accidentally play it with the guy that wrote that game, right? Like it's just super dope. So yeah, ChupacabraCon, bringing people together, including us. So it was absolutely delightful to meet you there. Thank you for coming to our panel and hanging out. And thanks for inviting me to the podcast. It has been an absolute pleasure. It was the first time for me to go to a gaming con. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Totally different than what I'm used to. So I was very, very impressed. So I'm glad that I went. So sending you massive amounts of love and good luck with not sleeping as you continue to <laughs> conquer these roles as you write. And to our listeners, go ahead and check out Mr. Russell. Give me some love. If you're not registered, if you're not subscribed to the podcast, make sure you do so. You don't want to miss a single episode. And thank you guys. Bye. <laughs>